Tonight on Newswire LA, Jan Perry, candidate for mayor. All of this and a Newswire LA extra coming up right after the credits. This morning, we're at a rally to celebrate the opening of Jan Perry's candidate headquarters here on Flower Street, just south of downtown. We're here to cover the rally and, more importantly, bring you our exclusive sit-down interview with Miss Perry herself. Let's start off by having Miss Perry tell us about all the things that led the Cleveland native to Los Angeles and her place in local government. Taking over the interview from that point on will be our Jamie Wright. came here for a Rose Bowl game and, you know, left the Midwest during this, the winter. And I was so amazed at how warm it was and that, you know, you could be here on January the 1st and wear shorts. I transferred to the University of Southern California and came 1974 and I just never looked back. And I came out here without any family, so I, I came out here all by myself. My father has passed away, but you know, I think at first, you know, to have your child go 3,000 miles away, no parent would like that. Mm -hmm. But when they saw me excel and do well and get good grades and graduate with honors and then go on to graduate school and then, you know, work hard and eventually my father was still alive uh, when I became involved in politics. And they cared about that because my father had been mayor of the place where I was raised and then my mother became the mayor. My mother's still living. So they, they were both very proud of what I accomplished. But I immersed myself in the community around the school and I was very involved and very engaged in tutoring children and you know, doing activities after class. And, and I became a part of this city very quickly. And so you are the council member for District 9 mm -hmm. in Los yes. Angeles. Now, for the person that is trying to understand city politics and is maybe a little confused about the shape of the district, can you explain the district to us and well, how where it runs? Half the district was chopped. The district was chopped in half during the last redistricting, so that's a little difficult to explain. But just suffice it to say that, you know, it, it, it is the eastern part of South Los Angeles and includes USC and it does still include LA Live and it goes down to about 90, 96th Street and runs along the 110 freeway and just the general boundaries, yeah. Okay, all right. And you have many accomplishments um, during your tenure. If you could point to one that you're extremely proud of, I'm sure you're proud of all of them, what would that one be? Gosh, that's difficult to say because there isn't just one. I've built a lot of housing. Mm -hmm. Um, I love this project that just opened up on Vermont, grandparents raising their grandchildren. And it's just a beautiful thing. It's got a vegetable garden and an art studio, and I'm very proud of that. Let's go back to what you said about the district being chopped in half. You know that there was sort of a controversy with CD8 and CD9. Yes. Um, and it was sort of the three black council members sort of pitted together. At least that's how the, the media portrayed it. How has your relationship with Councilmember Herb Wesson been since that controversy has unfolded? 
we're all very polite to That's each right. other. Okay. And are you and Councilmember Park still working on the same side? We, I think, are, Mr. Parks and I are very, very focused on making sure that our council districts have a, a bright economic future. And so your, your district is obviously very diverse. Mm -hmm. And what have some of the strategies been that you've used to sort of build a coalition, coalition base? Well, to, to show people that they have a lot in common. Everybody cares about their children. Everybody is concerned about making sure that the older folks and their families are, are taken care of and that people have a place to work, a place to buy you know, decent food, fruits and vegetables, a place to exercise. And so I focused on those issues that bind people together. And I just spend a lot of time not only building those projects, but talking to people about it. Let's transition into the campaign a little bit. Um, in the Huffington Post this week, I saw that some of your opponents were saying that you were the underdog and you were very clear about, do not underestimate my campaign. What is it about your campaign that you feel they would underestimate about? Well, I think that, uh, you know, at this point, they have, they have more money and uh, I, I'm assuming that, you know, they would try to parlay that into a message, but this campaign is not just about who has the most money. I mean, if it's about who has the most money, then you might as well just, you know, vote for that person today because they have the most money. That's not going to happen. This is a democracy. This is a competitive process. Uh, obviously, you saw what happened here today. I have a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of diversity. I have a very strong message, and I'm able to mobilize large numbers of people to get out and vote for me. And so what is that message that you're using to say, don't underestimate me? Um, I, you know, when people, you know, say I'm an underdog, it, it brings a smile to my face. It's their perception, not mine. And so, technically speaking, of the top four candidates, um, with the exception of Kevin James, I think he's a businessman, uh, the three of you are sort of considered city hall insiders, and I've heard that word used a lot, insiders, you know, status quo. What will your campaign do, you know, obviously you can say, I have experience, um, but what will you do to sort of overcome that presumption about being a city hall bureaucrat or city hall? Well, I think those are buzzwords that people in politics use. I mean, the question is, do the people out in the public actually believe that? I think today, the, the amount of people who have turned out here today and the uh, enthusiastic support that I have uh, indicates to me that people on the outside of those walls in city hall don't believe that rhetoric. It's just rhetoric. And so this week, there has been sort of a pouring in of money from Hollywood. I think I read the last figure was about a million dollars. And I know you got support from one of the Star Trek stars, George Takei. I, actually, it's George Takei. Uh, and uh, Lou Gossett has supported me. And I was really touched. And Dick Van Dyke. Uh, very touched and very flattered by all of their support. Um, because, you know, I grew up watching all of them. And they're, they're icons for me for different reasons. I mean, George Takei is an incredible advocate within the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community on an international scale. Lou Gossett, uh, African American Oscar Award winner, you know, and Dick Van Dyke basically shaped uh, and defined. Um, television uh, for all of us, well not for you, for, for people my age, uh, you know, growing up and he continues to, you know, entertain people. Well, I know Dick Van Dyke because of his work at the Midnight Mission and his work on homelessness. Okay. And so how do you think the influence of Hollywood dollars will affect your campaign or the election, the primary and the general camp election? You know, these, the folks who are supporting me aren't supporting me because they're from Hollywood. They're supporting me basically because they're activists who happen to be a part of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But they, they care about many causes, and, and that's how our lives have intersected each other. We are actually friends, or we, we know each other because we've worked together. Okay. And with your strong themes and messages in your campaign, if there's an undecided voter that you know wants to figure out who exactly they should vote for, how would you, or what would you do to convince them that they should vote for you for mayor? Well, I think what sets me apart is that I produce for people. I don't just talk, I do. And I have tangible results 
and I can show you what I've done. I can show you the housing I've built. I can show you the wetlands I've built. I can introduce you to people who have jobs because of the efforts that I have made uh, in downtown and, and South Los Angeles. I can show you downtown 11 years ago, and I can show you the work I have done over the last 11 years and point to any number of buildings and, and show you the difference that my presence here has made in a very tangible and specific way. Okay. So let's move into some of the issues. Speaking of tangibles, I know that your campaign has emphasized several issues that are very important to you. In terms of priority, which one would you prioritize? Would it be public safety or housing or a greener city? Which one would you? Well, you know, you, you, know, you build a, a budget and a city uh, and public safety always comes first because you have to make all the residents and the people who come here, travelers, tourists, investors, people who build here, everybody needs to feel safe. So that's a place to start. Okay. But then you have to make sure that people have jobs. And the smart mayor will build housing and jobs close to transportation mm -hmm. so we can get more cars off of the street, mm -hmm. clean the air, you know, make it a healthier healthier and more environmentally friendly city. Uh, and then, then more than that, we have to make sure everybody's child gets an education in a manner that if they choose to go on for a four-year college education, they will be prepared for that. So you have to make sure that everybody's child has the opportunity to have choices in the way their children are, children, in the way children are to be educated. Those are all great um, policies and things that you want to do. And, and I've heard that there's a belief that the day after the new mayor comes in office, the city is going to go bankrupt. Boom. So how are you going to handle putting all of the things in place that you want to put in place as mayor with this looming bankruptcy? And maybe it's rhetoric, but that's, that's the presumption. Well, I think we, we do face insolvency. We, we have a, a, a huge uh, structural deficit, uh, $216 million at this point for, for the upcoming fiscal year. And uh, we have a pension system that is not sustainable, mm -hmm. and our health care costs continue to rise. There's a great inequity uh, between our various public employee unions and what some groups pay versus what other groups pay. Mm -hmm. um, and so as mayor, I, I will need to bring everybody back to the table and to speak candidly and openly and honestly uh, and without rancor mm -hmm. uh, that if we're all going to be able, if, we're, if we all want to survive this, you know, we have to meet each other halfway and achieve a balance so that we can hit that break-even point where our system is sustainable. Mm -hmm. We have to return to core services and not continue to expand and, and to hire more people, um, but to focus on police, fire, sanitation, city attorney, planning, libraries, rec and parks, the basics. So the basics, public safety and fire, obviously they consume a lot, especially right. the police. 70% fire, uh, fire and police con consume 70% of our budget. So how do you, you know, increase public safety, maybe continue to hire police officers or you know, expand their budget while also, also making strong fiscal decisions? Well, you probably can't continue to. You can't continue to hire more police. We, our ranks have grown a bit because we absorbed uh, the police officers from the airport into LAPD. They used to be a separate entity. Now they will operate as one, you know, one unit. Um, so you have to take care of the people you have here. Uh, and not just continue to hire people knowing full well that you know we can't fund their pensions, we can't accommodate their health care costs. So first and foremost, you know we've probably laid off as many people as we can afford to lay off and still operate. People have taken an early retirement. Uh, you know furloughs save some money, but that's not the answer. So again, it's a refocus on how many employees do we have here, how many employees are in police and fire, and you know, how much they pay for their health care costs and their pension costs, and is that fair? Uh, and to find that balance. And so public safety is important for people living here, but education is important, obviously, for people with children, small, you know, teenage. So I know the current mayor is a fan of the charter schools. What are your feelings on the charter school? Well, I think he's a, he's a fan of test scores going upward, and, and you know, his uh, schools that he took over were not charter schools. Um, so. Uh, he started a, a movement mm -hmm. within the traditional schools to infuse them with resources to help bring their test scores up. 
and uh, the schools that he's taken over have shown improvement, uh, and that's numerically. So, you know, as mayor, obviously, I think that's something that should be continued uh, because progress in education more often than not is incremental. Uh, charter schools are not the answer to what troubles our traditional school system. They are merely an alternative. Um, and if parents want and demand choices, I think that parents should have those choices on how their children are to be educated. I think this mayor, Mayor Villaraigosa, opened the door mm -hmm. on that. And I think that his, his legacy, that will be part of his legacy. Okay. And so obviously if test scores are going up, people are doing better in school, there's more competition for jobs. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to bring to LA or create more job opportunities? Well, what I've done over the last 11 years has been uh, the leader uh, in being a strategic job creator uh, by connecting downtown to South Los Angeles. I worked on LA Live and the JW Marriott, the Nokia, the no new hotels on the north side of the street, the Wilshire Grand, all large catalytic developments that brought huge numbers of jobs into the city of Los Angeles. And in every case, whenever there was public money involved in any of those projects, I made sure the developers reached agreements with groups like Job Corps or, or Los Angeles Trade Technical College or the Coalition for Responsible Community Development to make sure they hired people from within a radius of the development, uh, people who were job ready, and, and to put them to work. And if they were younger and they needed experience through apprenticeships and, and journeyman positions, but to put people back to work. And so when most people think of LA, they think Hollywood. And I know there's been a lot of buzz about tax incentives, you know, productions moving to other cities. What will you do in order to keep Hollywood productions here so that there's more of an incentive for them to be here and also generate money for the city? Well, what I have done is I've already asked our chief legislative analyst to come back to us with an analysis so that we can see what the city of New York is doing, the city of New Orleans, cities specifically. There's two things going on here. There are state tax incentives or tax credits uh, that a state can offer, particularly to keep feature films here. And I believe the governor extended the state tax incentives to several years. That was important for feature films because in order to get ready for a feature film, you, you, know, you have to front load everything. It takes longer. Mm -hmm. So then you have to look at not only lobbying, uh, lobbying the governor for a longer period of time on that to keep the feature film business flowing in, but what can the city do? Um, we, we have a nonprofit here called Film LA, and they expedite permits, and they help with location management, and uh, basically help uh, production companies understand what the rules are to operate. Um, but there are certainly um, more things that a, a mayor can do to be very film friendly uh, and to keep the jobs here, not only in the city, but in the state of California. Okay. And on that same note, I know there's a lot of young professionals that are, at least you know, in my group, they feel like LA is more of a Hollywood place, it's not sustainable for them and what they want to do. How can you encourage or create an environment where young professionals want to stay in Los Angeles and they see the advantage of living here when it's really expensive and there may not be as many opportunities for them in their careers? Well, one of the things I'd like to do as mayor is uh, put, uh, look into creating a different kind of infrastructure and it, it could take uh, the shape of a fiber optics grid so that people who want to have startup businesses um, have a way to, uh, you know, have incentives to go in a community where there hasn't been as much activity and bring your business in your storefront, whatever it is you want to do or your online business and, you know, start your own businesses. I built a lot of housing.